have just a couple of logistical things to start us off. So um, if you would um, type your questions that you have for RAL throughout the presentation into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel, that would be great. Your other option is when we get to the question and answer portion of the presentation, you can use the little hand raising feature and go to webinar if you'd like to um, ask your question aloud over the telephone line. Uh, keep in mind that you do need to have your um, audio pin entered in order for me to be able to unmute your line because there's a, a growing, you know, 40, 50 and growing people on the phone line today. Everyone is on mute. So two options for asking your questions. Raise your hand and I can unmute your telephone line or type it into the GoToWebinar control panel and I will be able to ask it for you. A couple of things about the Patient Center Primary Care Institute before I turn things over. The Institute was launched late last year as a public-private partnership between the Oregon Health Authority, the Northwest Health Foundation, and Quality Corps. The purpose of the Institute is to offer technical assistance to practices that are transitioning or working towards the primary care home model of care. Uh, there are a few things the Institute does, one of which are the webinars, which you're joining us for today. Um, our website, which has some resources, including recordings of all of our previous webinars. And then um, we're working with 25 practices who are partnered with technical assistance experts in four different learning collaborative groups, and they have been working together since January of this year. Like I said, um, the Institute um, is partnered with the Oregon Health Authority's PCPCH program. Um, the PCPCH program is, is a series of standards defined by six core attributes. Um, the attributes are up on your screen, and you can read more about the PCPCH program at their website, which is linked below, including the 2014 um, standards, which have been updated and are available for you to review. We're also hosting a webinar about those in October if you need to learn more about that. Um, with that, I'm going to hand things over to Ariel Singer. Ariel um, works um, for the Oregon Primary Care Association, developing and teach teaching patient-centered communication, improved workflows, and motivational interviewing. She's worked with clinic staff members to enhance patient-centeredness and integrate motivational interviewing to support patients in adopting healthy behaviors. So we're very pleased that she can share some of that um, rich experience with us today on the webinar. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everybody. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about OPCA. So we are the uh, membership association for the Community Health Centers of Oregon. Um, we provide technical assistance and training in uh, a variety of uh, medical home and uh, health care reform subjects. And uh, we also provide state and federal policy support and advocacy for community health centers who serve some of Oregon's most vulnerable patients. If you would like to learn more about us, you can visit our website. And if you would like to sign up for our monthly medical home newsletter, um, please email my colleague Diane, whose email address you can see here on the screen. And um, in that newsletter, we provide um, information about um, key topics in medical home transformation and also information about our upcoming trainings. OK. Um, so what we're going to talk about today um, is enhancing patient-centeredness and patient-centered communication uh, within the context of a medical home practice. And we'll talk about this at a couple of different levels. So beginning by uh, defining patient-centered communication, talking about at the system level what kind of um, considerations um, are, are critical to adopting a more patient-centered approach. We will also talk about a variety of key concepts and tools in enhancing patient-centered communication. And then discuss in a little bit more specific or tactical ways how to get started with strengthening relationships between patients and primary care clinics. So let's begin by talking about why patient-centered care matters. Um, so to anchor this conversation to the PCPCH model, um, let's look at this um, attribute that we have here. So this is the core attribute six. 
recognizing that uh, patients are the most important part of the care team and are ultimately responsible for their own overall health and wellness. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that um, this is just about, about human respect for one another. And um, respect is really the right thing to do and also what we all want. So regardless of our role in the healthcare system as healthcare professionals, we are all also patients, and that is an asset to us in thinking about how to develop a more patient-centered approach to care, because we can consider, how do I want to be treated when I'm a patient? How do I want my loved ones to be treated when they are patients, and I'm a family member um, accompanying them um, into the healthcare system? And then we can take these these principles that we come up with or the specific ways in which we want to be treated and think about how might we apply those to the patients that we serve and really thinking about that golden rule of, of treating others in the way that you yourself would like to be treated. So in addition to this uh, um, you know, softer way of thinking about patient-centered care, we also have some um, more scientific evidence that patient-centered care works, that it improves the health status of patients, that it leads to more appropriate utilization of medical services, and it can improve um, treatment and uh, diagnosis outcomes and is really key to improving the interaction between patients and the healthcare system. So when we consider changing our approach to care, this proverb is a good way to think about it. So we're probably all familiar with this proverb, the saying, so give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. So what we've been doing is trying to give people fish. We are the experts, and people come to us, and we tell them, what to do, and um, that is supposed to improve their health. And in the new way, we are aiming to actually empower people to take care of their own health and to um, be more activated and more responsible for their health habits and their treatment processes and their long-term outcomes. So this change in paradigm is particularly critical in this age of uh, chronic conditions when so many people experience um, illness that is highly affected by daily habits and long-term behaviors and is not just about the care processes that take place within the context of a clinic, within the four walls of the, um, of the health center um, or the hospital. Um, really, people's health is most highly affected by what happens outside of the healthcare system when they are really the only ones who can do anything about um, uh, their, their habits and their choices. So I was going to show you a comic that I realized um, that I did not have my copyright situation totally straightened out with, so I'm just going to tell you about it instead. So this is Hagar the Horrible, the Viking, um, who's been around for quite some time. So in the first pane of this comic, it, um, he's sitting and talking to his doctor, and his doctor saying, stop overeating, stop drinking, stop staying out late, stop fighting, stop worrying, stop eating sweets, stop gambling. And in the second pain, his wife says to him, what did the doctor say? And his response is, I don't know. I stopped listening. So this is probably pretty familiar to us, both what the doctor is telling the patient, but then also this response on the part of Hagar, the patient. And this is a really normal response. Nobody likes to be lectured and told what to do. And this is a natural human reaction to kind of tune that out and to begin to um, check out of that relationship and to not really fully listen and engage. So this is a really uh, pragmatic change that we are trying to make, both that we are treating people with more respect and listening better to their experiences and their priorities in the hopes also that they, as patients, will 
listen better and become more engaged. And by feeling more respected, we'll then have a um, greater likelihood to really partner with us and begin to uh, take steps to change their own lives and their own habits so that they can improve their health in the long term. So another way to think about this um, is offered to us by Dr. Don Berwick, who is a leading physician um, and has been for many years, formerly from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and CMS. He has written extensively about a variety of issues within health system uh, reform. And this is from an article that he wrote about um, adopting a more patient-centered approach to care. And it's a really great article that I would recommend reading if you have the opportunity. It's, you can find it at, at the, the reference to it at the end of the slide, but it's titled, What Patient-Centered Should Mean, Confessions of an Extremist. So he says in this article, I have come to believe that we, patients, families, clinicians, and the healthcare system as a whole would all be far better off if we professionals recalibrated our work such that we behaved with patients and families not as hosts in the care system, but as guests in their lives. So he's talking here about really changing the paradigm and reorienting ourselves such that we have a more fundamental respect for the autonomy of individuals and think about prioritizing their needs and their wishes and concerns and desires first, and seeing them as the leaders of all of the care processes with which we engage in ourselves as um, the guests in that process rather um, than the host. So this is really trying to um, really turn things on their head and to say this is not um, our terrain. And, and patients are just coming into our territory. But instead, this is their lives is their terrain. And we are coming in as guests. And we should treat that relationship with the kind of respect that it deserves. So this is a set of operational definitions to patient-centered care. So we have to know what it is that we're really talking about when we talk about patient-centeredness. So the first two bullets that you see here really have um, an emphasis on a non-medical orientation to care. So saying that our starting point in patient-centered care should be trying to relate to and understand the patient as a whole person and to understand their context and to understand their uh, thinking and their feeling and where they're coming from as a person, not just thinking about them as a set of diagnoses or a problem list. And then the second two bullets are really more about how we engage then in care processes with patients when we're coming from this new orientation. It's really about sharing power and sharing control over the medical issues with which we are partnering with them about. Um, so this is really about trying to see people in a different way. And then from that place, then begin to interact with them and to make decisions with them in a different way. So another way to describe this is with um, phrases or slogans that we can use to help us maintain this um, new orientation or new paradigm. So these are also from that same article by Dr. Berwick and are from a variety of uh, healthcare organizations or experts around the world. Um, so there's a few different options here to think about. You might want to adopt these. You might want to come up with your own. Here's just a few to think about. So this first one is really about putting the needs of the patient first every time. So not making decisions about how we do things based on convenience or habit or routine, but trying to respond to the individual person and the individual families that we are serving. 
Um, the second one, nothing about me without me, is really emphasizing transparency and participation, this kind of shared control that is really a different way of approaching the decision-making processes and the care processes than what we are accustomed to. And then every patient is the only patient is really coming back to that idea of individuality and customization of care, responding to individual people rather than to a um, set of assumptions about what we should do or about what we were trained to do or what um, people with broad brush strokes expect, but really trying to listen well to the person who is right in front of us. So another maxim that might be useful is one that um, my boss, Lori Francis, who ran a health center in Montana for a long time, adopted at her health center, uh, which was every patient, every time. So again, really trying to think about how we can come to every person that we serve with the same uh, sincere respect and uh, acknowledgement of their autonomy and individuality and personal experience. So this is a set of recommendations from a Commonwealth Fund funded report about how to go about adopting a more patient-centered approach to care. And what we see emphasized here is uh, common, really, to most change efforts, right? Leadership engagement, organizational alignment, so connecting any kind of change to the vision and mission of the organization, communicating that to everyone so that everyone is all working in the same direction and to accomplish the same mission and purpose. Involving patients and families at a variety of levels, so um, not just in the care processes in the way that I've been describing, but also involving patients and families as advisors or participants in quality improvement committees, uh, perhaps on a board if you are a health center, that's a requirement. And if you're another kind of practice, you might um, choose a different way to proactively um, elicit the opinions and experiences of your patients. So there's a, a, a really wide variety of ways to do this. Um, and then really thinking about the reality that we are all humans and that we are all humans together. And if we want staff and clinicians to treat patients with respect, then we also have to create a respectful and supportive work environment so that everyone is having that experience of uh, human autonomy respected and their um, their own experience supportive enough so that they can provide that to others. Then systematic measurement and feedback, again, is a cornerstone of any change effort, any quality improvement effort. And then using the environment of the clinic, really thinking about how we can create a welcoming space. How can we create um, a, a context within which people feel like they're being acknowledged and respected as humans. And then using data and using information, information technology to serve all of these other goals. So I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions before I continue. Hi there, this is Kate. So if, um, if you have questions at this point, you can type them into the GoToWebinar control panel or you can click the little hand raise button and I can unmute your line. The one question um, I did get was whether or not the slides will be available and they are posted to the Institute website. A recording of the webinar will be posted to the website um, by the end of the, of the day as well. Um, there are also some additional um, attachments and materials posted to the site as well um, that you can access after the webinar. Um, I think you may be able to press on, and if I get any other questions, we'll um, take them in the next time that we stop. Okay, sounds good. All right, so we've been talking at this more kind of high-level overview uh, level, 
And now we're going to begin to move into talking about some of the specifics. So how can we go about actually adopting a more patient-centered approach to care? So I am going to show you now a model, if I can get the slide to change over. There we go. Um, so this is showing a hierarchy of patient-centered interactions. So the, the um, Two bottom levels of this pyramid, I really think probably sh it shouldn't narrow between relationship and communication. Those are really relevant to all of the patients that we serve and are about the fundamental skills and behaviors of a patient-centered office visit, a patient-centered interaction within the context of a normal primary care visit. And then as we move up this pyramid in patient-centered interaction, we begin to um, approach the skills and the behaviors that are relevant for a subset of the patients who are in need of self-management support or who are in need of therapeutic communication. So this might include things like considering their level of patient activation, conducting brief action planning around self-management goals, using motivational interviewing to discuss movement towards behavior change around um, health behaviors, and then at the level of therapeutic interaction, um, behavioral health interventions, which is not something that I'll talk about really today, but I just want to acknowledge that that is part of this framework of, of thinking about what kind of therapeutic communication can we bring to patients. So I also want to acknowledge that as we move up this pyramid, there is an uh, increasing intensity of training required to deliver this kind of communication. So something to think about as you consider uh, adopting patient-centered communication as a skill set, um, and think about that as you lay out a strategy for doing so, of how much training is required, who's going to receive it, and what that is going to look like. So we're going to start by talking about the basics on this level of relationship and communication, the fundamentals of a patient-centered office visit. So I'm going to show you a few examples of patient-centered office visit skills and then talk about a specific tool that is really effective for building patient-centered office visit skills. So the kinds of things that I'm talking about are um, setting an agenda with a patient at the beginning of a visit, uh, maintaining, um, setting and maintaining a sense of engagement or rapport with the patient, using out loud thinking to describe what is happening with the patient as a way to maintain your agenda and to maintain a sense of partnership. Um, using the electronic medical record in a way that you are sharing control with the patient and using transparency, coming back to that idea of nothing about me without me. Um, when you're conducting a physical exam, describing to the patient what you're going to be doing and as you're doing it, perhaps telling them what's happening, always sharing your findings back with them immediately following any kind of assessment. Um, as you share information, avoiding or explaining jargon, um, really trying to address both biomedical and social, psychosocial concerns, and trying to find out from the patient uh, what they think, what their questions might be. So this is trying to address some of the issues around health literacy that we know are pretty substantial for a lot of the population, that um, many people just simply will not understand if we speak to them in jargon. And even people who have a high level of health literacy and are well-educated or have experience with the healthcare system, if they are in distress, if they've just received a significant diagnosis, if they are feeling sick, then it will be very difficult for even them to be able to discern the meaning, meaning of jargon 
and to comprehend um, technical information. So we always want to think about how we can explain things in simple terms and try to increase the likelihood that patients will even understand what it is that we're talking about. So the tool that I think is really fantastic for working on patient-centered office visit skills was created by a uh, counselor, family um, psychologist, and counselor, and researcher at the University of Washington, Larry Mauch, who we at OPCA have worked with over the past few years to provide training to our health centers. Um, he developed this model for team training um, that uses this model of peer learning and peer observation and feedback so that teams can work together to develop patient-centered office visit skills using this set of guidelines on a two-sided form. This is a snapshot of one part of the form, um, but there is one version that is intended for a, a provider and one version that's intended for a medical assistant or a nurse. And it describes the specific behaviors of a more provider-centered or biomedical approach to conducting an office visit, um, and then a more patient-centered or biopsychosocial approach to conducting an office visit. Um, so this approach not only enhances the ability of care teams to provide patient-centered care, but it also enhances their ability to communicate with each other and work together more effectively and more efficiently, efficiently as a team-based approach to training. So um, training teams together, getting them doing peer observations and providing feedback to each other naturally enhances the communication and the shared humanness on the team, which then translates to better and more patient-centered care for patients. So I think this is a particularly powerful tool because what we are talking about here is changing culture. And culture is often unconscious beliefs and behaviors, ways of doing things that we are not even thinking about or realizing that we're doing on a conscious level. And that really makes it difficult to change. So by creating this set of behavioral guidelines that are very, very nuts and bolts, and then giving us a tool with which to observe each other and to develop what Larry Mouch calls an observer self, to be able to step back and be mindful about our own behaviors and how it is that we are approaching patients, then we have the opportunity to begin to see with more clarity what, is, what our culture is composed of and to think about how we can begin to change it, rather than simply operating from this unconscious place, um, which is really based in the history of, of medical culture and training. So this is not to vilify anyone. Um, people have been trained to operate in a, in a certain way, and what we are realizing is that that way is uh, not really going to serve us any longer. Um, as a healthcare community of healthcare providers or as patients, that that is just simply not the way forward if we want to improve outcomes. So this is another sample from the patient-centered observation form that shows you, again, these specific kinds of behaviors that will allow us to create a more patient-centered experience within an office visit. So I have included um, at the end of this slide deck a slide on training resources, and Kate has also posted some of that information onto the PCPCI website. Larry Mouch is an excellent trainer. He really understands the experience of primary care. He's been working in the family medicine clinic at the University of Washington for a long time. He's really engaging and funny, and um, he is available to provide training, and I do highly recommend him. And he also has some online resources through the University of Washington um, that you will see, again, 
on the website and at the end of this slide deck, you can actually do an online training on the patient-centered observation form if you want to learn more about it and to see a little bit more about how it works. So I'm going to pause again here before I go on to talk about the upper two levels of the pyramid, the hierarchy of patient-centered interactions, and um, see if anybody has any questions about the basics of a patient-centered office visit. Hi, this is Kate. Again, you can type questions into the questions pane and go to webinar, or you can raise your hand and I can um, unmute your telephone line and you can ask your question directly. Um, one question that did come in um, that I'll go ahead and do now is, um, what, what would you say to people who say or think that um, this adds time or adds too much time or um, takes up a lot of time in a visit? Um, well, that is certainly a concern that many people raise. And I do acknowledge that training takes time and that that will take time away from providing care if you're going to take time to train people. Um, which I do think is the only way for people to begin to change their behaviors is to receive training. Um, but the beauty of this approach, um, and, and I can talk a little bit more about the self-management support strategies as well, but the, the beauty of this basic patient-centered office visit approach is that it actually saves time and it creates efficiency by improving communication. So you um, begin by setting an agenda and being really clear and transparent about how much time you have in the visit and creating a shared and agreed upon plan for how you're going to spend that time together. And then you have the opportunity as you move through the visit to um, come back to that agenda and acknowledge if you're getting off track and again make a shared decision about moving to a different topic. and. Um, in that way, you are able to work together with the patient to make the most use of the time that you have together because I acknowledge that it's very limited. And it really doesn't take long to set an agenda. It would really be a minute or so um, that you would need to have that initial conversation, what in motivational interviewing is called a meta conversation, so a conversation about your conversation before you begin saying, what are we going to do in our 15 or 20 minutes together here today? Um, the other asset um, to this approach is that in this team-based training and this team-based model, as you in, enhance the ability of the team to work together, you're also able to maximize the total amount of time that you have with the patient um, and have everybody working together um, to meet the needs of the patient and then communicating with each other more effectively about what they have learned. So if you increase the ability of the PCP and the medical assistant to communicate about each of their interactions with the patient, then you are making better use of the total amount of time that you have. Um, so I think the um, maxim that it takes time to make time might be true here, that you, you have to put time up front into training and figuring out how to create efficient communication flows between the medical assistant and the PCP within the context of a visit. But once you sort those things out, then you're actually able to make better use of the time that you have and to be more efficient in um, providing care. Great. And then there were a couple other um questions that came in. Um, so one was about the patient-centered observation form tool. Can you talk about in what settings this has been used? And then the other question was also about the tool, which is who does the observation and completes the form? Okay, so this has been used. Larry does a lot of training with medical students and um, in a variety of different institutions. So this is something that he has um, done a, a lot in, in the context of medical education, um, but has also begun to be used uh, within practices by practicing um, physicians and care teams. And um, there's been a couple of 
health centers here in Oregon that have begun to use the patient-centered observation form to work on um, team training and team-level skill development. Um, and the observations can be conducted either by two peers, so for example, a physician um, observing a physician and providing feedback, um, and then a medical assistant observing a medical assistant and providing feedback, which is probably a more comfortable way to begin acknowledging the hierarchy within um, um, healthcare systems in terms of, of, of power and, and um, those kinds of things. Um, but really, the, the greatest impact would be if you had people on the same team observing each other. So if you had the medical assistant observing the physician and vice versa, so that they could learn better about what exactly is happening during their interactions with the patient and be able to not only help each other learn how to uh, be more patient-centered in their approach, but how to create um, a more continuous experience for the patient and how to communicate more effectively with each other about providing good care and well-coordinated care between the time that the medical assistant spends with the patient and the time that the PCP spends with the patient, which is usually not at the same time. And so by educating each other about what's happening, really, um, then you also have the opportunity to work together more effectively. All right, I think we'll take one more and then we'll um, have you move on. So there were some questions about um, to implement this, you know, requires providers to change their culture, which has been established for years of schooling. Are there any suggestions you have on how to change culture? And then also um, for, you know, established providers, uh, can you speak to the difficulties given the fee-for-service culture? Um, so I think in terms of changing culture, one of the reasons that I think this is a really great approach is because it kind of backs you into culture, changing culture through behavior. So rather than trying to begin by addressing unconscious beliefs and attitudes, um, which is really pretty difficult to do because they are so often just unspoken and usually unacknowledged ways of viewing the world. We can actually begin by changing our behavior. And then over time, culture and attitudes and beliefs will catch up with the changes in behavior. And I think people become convinced or persuaded by the evidence that they see in front of them. Um, that their interactions with their patients are smoother, they feel like they have a better grasp of how to manage time in the visit, how to manage the experience of um, structuring the visit in a more strategic way. Um, and I think that is a process that will have to happen over time. I think changing culture is certainly not something that we can do overnight, but that by beginning to change behavior and by beginning to change how people work together and how they approach visits with patients, then they will, um, I think, over time begin to see things differently. And I can certainly say that that was my experience in learning motivational interviewing, um, that I began by changing my behavior to conduct motivational interviewing interventions and then over time found myself and my own belief system really deeply transformed by that. So in terms of the fee-for-service model, um, so what Larry suggests in terms of a training approach is to have um, a set number of visits, maybe one per week or whatever seems appropriate, that are a little bit longer so that you have time to conduct the ob observations and provide each other with feedback, um, but that your other visits would not be affected by trying to use the patient-centered observation form to do team training and team skill development. And even one visit per week doing observations would really be tremendous. That would be a lot. I think you don't even need to do it that much to have an impact. I think, you know, just like with anything, the more training, the more quickly you will see results. Um, but this is certainly not something that, that needs to lengthen every single visit. Uh, but where you have specific times that you designate for training and then can operate in the same way at other times, having developed this increased awareness around your behavior, this observer self, and then uh, beginning to change your behavior across all your visits, even when you don't actually have an observer there in the room with you. 
Okay, so let's move forward and then we'll come back to questions at the end of this next section. So I'm going to talk now about this upper part of the pyramid in which we are moving beyond just the basics of an off, a patient-centered office visit and talking about approaches to self, providing self-management support and therapeutic communication. So the same is true here, that as you increase the intensity of your intervention, you have a smaller number of patients for whom it is appropriate and a higher amount of training that is required on the part of the staff to deliver that intervention. So across this whole, um, really across any patient population, uh, we're seeing increasing evidence that considering patient activation is a good starting point. Um, and I'll talk more in a moment about patient activation and what that consists of. Um, and then we can look at these um, interventions for providing self-management support and thera therapeutic communication. Um, again, scaled according to the level of patient acuity or patient needs. So at the bottom we have brief action planning, which is a specific way of providing um, uh, goal setting um, support to patients. Uh, motivational interviewing, which is appropriate for helping people consider changing behaviors. And then uh, behavioral health um, interventions, which is um, appropriate for people who are in need of more uh, mental health or behavioral health um, therapy. So let's talk first about patient activation. So patient activation is a construct that was developed here in Oregon actually by Judith Hibbard and her colleagues. And it is, um, has three domains, knowledge, skills, and confidence. So these are um, the domains that are required for someone to um, not only understand but to act proactively and with success um, to take care of their own health and to participate fully in the care process. Um, so they came up with these domains and created a validated scale that uh, creates a score um, upon which people are measured their level of activation and there's been a fair amount of research conducted using the, using the patient activation measure at this point and has uh, been established that people with higher PAM scores are more likely to adhere to treatment, to get preventive care, to participate fully in decisions about their care, um, to engage in healthy behaviors, and to seek out and use health information appropriately. Um, there was also a number of articles published in the February issue of Health Affairs, this, uh, February of this year, um, that was beginning to connect patient activation scores to cost savings. So people with lower activation scores uh, were shown to have higher costs in terms of their utilization of the healthcare system. Um, so this is a measurement that could be conducted um, with all patients and then can be used as a way to customize or tailor interventions, customize or tailor the approach to care according to the level of activation. So this is a display of these four levels of um, activation. Um, which start from taking a more passive role, not really having very much confidence in your knowledge or skills about how to um, take um, more responsibility for your own health, playing a more active role in your care, and then moving into the second level of building those skills, um, the third level taking action, and then the fourth level uh, maintaining those behaviors. Um, and at the very highest level in number four, um, being able to maintain them even in the face of stress or health crises. So acknowledging that even somebody who really um, is doing pretty well to take care of their health will struggle with that um, if they are under duress and that um, we should acknowledge that in how we approach people. Um, so even if they, they are highly activated, if they have a significant diagnosis that they receive, then that may be um, affected. So there's um, a, a lot of information out there at this point about um, what the, these different um, PAM scores, um, how they affect 
um, outcomes, how they affect the ways people are likely to participate in the healthcare system, and also some good examples of how the PAM is being used to actually tailor the provision of care. And in the references to the slide deck, you'll see that there's a case study that was written by some researchers at UCSF about a practice in Eugene that is using the PAM um, to provide more customized medical home services to their patients. So that's a good resource if you're interested in seeing more about how this is actually being implemented. So brief action planning is a model um, that is based in the spirit and methods of motivational interviewing, but is a simplified and even briefer intervention than motivational interviewing and is appropriate for more ready and more activated patients. Um, so there, it doesn't have as much of an emphasis on exploring and resolving ambivalence as motivational interviewing and helps, motivational interviewing is really effective in helping less ready um, or less activated patients. And um, this is a good approach um, for those who seem pretty ready to begin um, action planning around health behavior change. So it consists of these three questions that you can see in the blue rectangles, and then uh, some additional skills that are described in those um, oval shapes, along with a fifth one that is not pictured here, that is about follow-up. So creating continuity and accountability over time, checking back in with people to see how their plan is unfolding and to see what kind of additional support can be offered over time. So brief action planning is, has been developed out of evidence-based models and is um, beginning to be investigated itself uh, to create an evidence base for this approach. And there's online training available in conducting brief action planning if you go to the website that is um, pictured here. And I believe Kate is also putting a link to that on the PCPCI website. Um, there is online training available and more information about brief action planning available um, on, on the web. So motivational interviewing is a more robust approach than brief action planning, so it's a more expanded version um, of this same idea of working with patients in partnership to create personal action plans to change health behaviors. Um, and it has been around for several decades now and has come to be used pretty commonly within the medical home context as a strategy for providing self-management support. So it is a effective as a brief intervention, which makes it appropriate for primary care. Um, and it's based on the idea that change is a natural and ongoing human experience, and that we, as care providers, can help people speed up their own trajectory of change. So it's not that we come in from outside and create change, uh, but we, with partnership and facilitation, can help people connect to their own internal motivation and their own internal resources um, to create the change that they want to see in their lives. So it has, at this point, been investigated in a wide variety of settings and contexts and with a wide variety of populations. And um, its efficacy has been demonstrated for a variety of different health outcomes. And um, it is um, a really well aligned with this respectful and uh, humanistic approach to providing medical services that we are trying to move towards. Um, so in this box at the bottom, you can see one of the basic beliefs of motivational interviewing, that uh, when we approach people with acceptance for both who they are and what they're doing in their lives, it gives them the freedom to consider change rather than needing to defend against it. So we know that the reality is that we cannot change anyone else's life, no matter how much we might want to um, from a well-intentioned place, and no matter how much we might lecture or admonish, 
Um, and so instead of banging our heads up against this reality, we work with it. And we support autonomy, and we support people's right to choose, and we try to partner with them in such a way that we can increase the likelihood that they will um, create changes in their lives that will support better long-term health. So this is a description of the spirit of motivational interviewing, which is really, in my opinion, the heart of patient-centered care, approaching people with this kind of um, set of mind and heart, in the words of Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick, who are the developers of motivational interviewing. So really trying to come to um, patients with this attitude um, of partnership, of acceptance, supporting autonomy, using empathy to demonstrate that we understand where people are coming from and that we accept them for who they are, compassion, um, knowing that we are all doing what we do, providing care and working within the healthcare system in the service of others. This is um, why we're all here. Um, and then also approaching people with this goal of evocation, of trying to find out from them what it is that they want for their own lives, what it is that they think is important for their health, for their health, and then partnering around that, um, rather than trying to install our ideas about what they should be doing or use tactics of persuasion or coercion, um, instead approaching people with an invitation and with the desire to uh, find out from them what matters and how they might want to go about moving closer to the things that matter to them. So the specific ways that we do that in motivational interviewing is using this basic toolkit, and there's a lot of additional skills and specifics within the motivational interviewing uh, set of methodologies, but just to give you this really uh, summary level view, um, we use these specific communication approaches. So asking open-ended instead of closed questions, using affirmations to provide people with positive feedback to let them know that we acknowledge their strengths and the ways in which they are caring for themselves and are showing up as engaged patients, using reflective listening to demonstrate that we hear them, that we, uh, that we are trying to understand and acknowledge and respect where they're coming from, and um, using summaries to connect the dots to um, create that picture, um, as we discussed in the beginning of the hour, of a whole person within their own unique um, biopsychosocial context. Um, so let's talk now about specifically how you might get started. So first, I want to advocate for not delaying this effort to improve the nature of your relationship with patients. So there's a lot of important operational changes that are required to become a medical home. Things like changing your access model, creating impanelment, improving care coordination and care management. So there's a lot of very technical operational changes that are um, important to make. But if you don't begin to work on changing culture and changing the quality and attributes of your relationships with patients, then all of those other changes will not um, create a truly patient-centered model of care. You won't have the heart in it if you don't take the time to put it there. Because the reality is simply that our, our um, history has, has brought us to this place of not having a patient-centered culture within the healthcare system. And we have to very proactively try to turn the Titanic here. Um, creating organizational alignment is critical to any change efforts and um, will really make a difference in terms of supporting the effort of, of staff and, and clinicians to adopt a more patient-centered approach. So being sure to make sure that everyone understands why you are doing this and why this is central to the mission and vision of your organization. 
investing in training and time in the clinic for, for clinicians and staff to both practice and then learn new skills. The only way to learn a new skill is through practice, through um, feedback from others and um, over time, truly. Um, I think facilitating discussions with folks about their personal motivation and inspiration for providing patient-centered care is a great way to approach this, um, given that we are, we are all humans in this and we all want to do the right thing. And we're all in this profession because we want to help. And so I think leveraging people's um, good intentions is, is really powerful. So another way to do that is to, together with your staff and your own organization, create your own operational definition of patient-centered care or your own slogan, um, like the ones that were depicted on the slide earlier, um, so that you can, in, in your own words, describe uh, why you're doing this and create that sense of, of shared uh, dedication um, to this task. Uh, measuring your progress, figuring out how to quantify your efforts and monitoring your progress and celebrating your success is a powerful way to support any change effort. And then again, coming back to the idea of involving patients in whatever way you can. So maybe um, involving them in quality improvement projects, advisory committees, um, doing uh, patient surveys or, or focus groups, trying to find out what the experience of your patient patients is like and how they think you should go about improving your provision of care and creating a more patient-centered approach. So this last slide that I'll present before I take additional questions is uh, some training resources. And um, you'll see here that there are some options for most of the topics that I covered today, and Kate is putting those things on the um, PCPCI website as well. So we have a few minutes, and I'd be happy to take um, any questions that we have time for. Hi, there was one um, question um, about eliciting patient feedback on the observation form and whether that's been done or is that the way that the form's been used at all? So there and was not, one clinic that um, I have worked with that um, had told me that they were planning to do that, and I don't know if they have actually done it. That is not how the form was designed, um, but it certainly seems like it could be used that way. It would probably be, be helpful for everyone's level of comfort to start by having um, the employees observe each other and provide each other with feedback. And I think it would be really powerful to bring in patients as, a, as observers, but you would have to provide them with training and um, help them, you know, orient them to the purpose of what you're doing and, and what the process looks like. And I certainly think that would be worth the effort. Um, but it would probably um, be a little bit more challenging as a starting point both for the comfort level of those who are being observed and then also because the amount of time that would be required to, to, to prepare patients to do that effectively. So then there was one um, additional question, again, on the observation form. Is the understanding correct that um, there is a person doing the patient visit in the room and then there is an additional person in the room observing them? Is that right? Yes, that is and correct. And, and do so, you um, have any talking points on, like, you know, explaining that to a patient or any tips on that? Yeah, so you definitely want to prepare patients for that, get their permission. And then um, some of uh, the other good strategies to keep in mind are to, to position the observer so that they are out of the direct line of sight of the patient and to have the observer maintain um, a pretty withdrawn demeanor. So even if the patient is trying to address them, because um, the patient will naturally try to talk to whoever's in the room. So um, that's not to say you should, you know, try to be uh, rude or anything, but to try to kind of keep your eyes down and to maintain this um, more withdrawn kind of um, presence 
so that the patient is not trying to address the observer instead of addressing the person who is actually providing them with services in that moment. So thinking about how to configure the room, maybe putting the observer kind of just behind the person to whom the patient is, is speaking, and then having them um, try to have that more fly on the wall kind of presence and let the patient know that that's what they're doing and that they're there um, to uh, work on on everyone's skills and um, to get their permission. I think most most patients have um, been in a situation where there has been students or they know about um, you know quality efforts and so are are likely to um, agree. But you do certainly want to get their consent and then create a setup so that that observer is out of the way. Okay, and then there was just um, one quick clarification question, and then it's nine, so we'll go. Um, the observer is usually a staff person, is that right? Um, yeah, so the, the model is, uh, is intended for um, employees to provide observation and feedback to each other. So it might be a peer, so a PCP observing a PC, PCP, or it might be a teammate. So the, the team nurse observing the PCP, or the MA observing the nurse. And then um, someone suggested that you might do this with patients, and I certainly think that could be um, a great approach to use, but, but generally the starting point is to do it with um, staff members observing each other. Excellent. Well, it is nine on the dot, so I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. You can access, again, a recording of this presentation and the PDF at our website, um, and please help us continue to deliver great presentations by completing the survey that will pop up right after the webinar concludes. And thanks a lot um, to Arielle for sharing uh, what she knows with us today. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate your time.